You're listening to the Mobcast Network. That was very organic. I yeah, that was perfect. It was not even planned. I'm your name of American Pop Culture Spirit Guide, Scotty, and I'm joined by, as always, co-host Baby Yoda Jr. <laughs> Are this what we're calling you now? Baby Yoda Jr. <laughs> so <that's> BYJ. BYJ. <laughs> <laughs> Just like you in the Wu-Tang Clan. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm all in. Welcome to episode two. This week we discuss the second episode of The Mandalorian, also known as The Child. Uh, currently my uh, current favorite episode of the Mandalorian thus far, <laughs> out of the two, we've out done, of the two, the two that we've done, the two we've done, uh, it's my favorite episode, even out of in 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 the future. Right. So you know, as we record, there have been five. So. Yeah, it's my favorite of the five thus far. I still like four. We'll get to it. No oh boy, I can't wait. <laughs> I, really I have some factoids of negativity to fire <laughs> on four. <laughs> oh, that'd be fun to get with. So uh, let's just dive into it. So the child was written by John Fav- Favreau, and was directed by Rick uh, Fumiyua. Who did Dope and The Wood? He's also done some other cool, but Dope is awesome. Oh, yeah, he's a great director. Episode stars, uh, as always, uh, Pedro Pascal has The Mandalorian. Here's something fun Misty Roses as Khalil. Do you know Misty Roses? I do not. Misty Rose, so she's the body of Khalil the Ugnon. So Nick Nolte does the voice. She's the, the performer in the. Oh, in fantastic. The, in the ma- makeup. She has been in a ton of things. She's done a lot of stunt work. I'm going to start with her stunt work. She was in Three Kings, Practical Magic. She was in The Hunger Games Catching Fire. Oh, wow. But she's not a, she is not a stranger to wearing suits and you know costumes and being different things. She was Barry Barrington in the Country Bears movie. Oh, my gosh. And she was Amy the Gorilla in Congo. No way. Yes. Now, full circle, Congo needs to be on our other podcast. <laughs> we'll do it. We'll do it. We'll, yeah. we'll do uh Ape lasers? Are you kidding me? <laughs> Give me those fr- fr- freaking gorillas some lasers. <laughs> we'll do uh, uh, Congo in January. And if you want to hear that, that me and uh, Drew host a, a, a deep movie podcast called The Catacombs, which is also on the Mopcast Network. So if you follow the Mopcast Network, you've seen it in your feed. You may have listened to it. Hopefully so. The Jawas were played by Stephen Jackson Powers Jr., Douglas Farrell, Joseph S. Griffio, Molly Miller, and Kyle uh, Peckick. And they mostly, I mean, they've done some other stuff. There, there are a lot of little people work, um, but a lot of stunt work. There's a lot of stunt acting here. But for our bounty puck, our special highlight, let's talk about Nick Nolte. Goldmine Nick Nolte. Nick Nolte. Uh, also has been in 48 Hours, we, as we talked last week. Down on Beverly Hills, Blue Chips, Mulholland Falls, Mother Night, and Affliction. I was trying to, but outside of 48 Hours, I was trying to pick up movies that, that we didn't talk about last week. Nicholas King Nolte was born in Omaha, Nebraska, February 8th, 1941. He was nominated for three Oscars. Do you know which movies? Was one of them Weeds? No. Dang it. I'm pretty sure he's But he, he was nominated for a Golden Globe for Weeds. So, well, oh, he, so, so there I we go. Have points for that. Yeah. I'll give you that. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't actually know. So in, uh, from wait, the, one's with Barbara Streisand. Yes. What the crap is the name of that movie? Whatever it is, I don't remember. Prince of Tides. Prince of Tides. So we'll start from the earliest, then go to the latest. <laughs> the Prince of Tides was first, Affliction, and then Warrior. Oh, nice. He's nominated for five Golden Globes and one went for the Prince of Tides in 1991. As a boy in 1962, a young man, Nolte was convicted for selling fake draft cards and was sentenced to a 75-year jail sentence and a $75,000 fine. He was suspended. It was suspended under the terms of the Youth Corrections Act and was on probation through the length of the Vietnam War. Unreal. He was warned by the judge that if he was arrested for any other crime, he would be jailed under the original conviction terms. Whoa. Wow. That's kind of crazy. 
He attended Benson High and was expelled for fighting and hiding beer before practice during football games and was caught drinking in during practice sessions. He later attended Pasadena City College in Southern California, Arizona State University in Tempe, Eastern Arizona College in Thatcher, and Phoenix College in, uh, in Phoenix. At Eastern Arizona, uh, Nulty led in football as a tight end and a defensive end in, ba- and, in basketball with a, as a forward and as a catcher on the baseball team. So I want to play a game with you called Alternate Universe. Uh-oh. Or well, let's just call it the multiverse. Let's because it's the same thing with limbo when what we do. The multiverse. The multiverse. I have one, two, three, four, five famous movies that Nick Nolte could have been in and was not <laughs> oh cast. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, I'm in. So I just want you to imagine, and then I'll let you comment on on <laughs> each and every one of them. Ready? Yep. Along with Christopher Walken. Who were both considered for the role of Han Solo in Star Wars Episode Dear Four? G- the grumpiest. Now, what's funny is I was waiting to bring up the fact that who would you say is more grumpy? Get off my plane or get off my plane? Because both of them sound like grumpy asshole. <laughs> they are there, but Nulty started to sound it always sounded that way. So yeah, it's like that's true. So Harrison Ford was a little charmer in the beginning. That's true. That's unreal. Oh, this gets better. <laughs> All right, so I'm, I'm trying to do this in year order. All right, so <clears throat> the following year, he was considered for the role of Superman and Clark Kent in <laughs> Superman 1978, oh which went to Christopher Reeve. Legend has it that he wanted to play the role as a schizophrenic. <laughs> oh, my, this is amazing. Nick Nolte is Superman, directed by Richard Donner, right. who's also kooky. <laughs> right. Can you imagine? They, they wouldn't have made it two weeks. There's no <laughs> way. There's no way it would have happened. Not at all. He eagerly pursued the role of Captain Benjamin Willard in Apocalypse Now oh, when God. Harvey Keitel was fired. Nolte thought he had the role, and then Coppola gave it to Martin Sheen. Unbelievable. <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> he was considered for the role of John Rambo in First Blood. <laughs> nope. Which went to <laughs> Sylvester Stallone. <laughs> nope. I can only I can see him as the sheriff. He could have been the sheriff. He could have been Brian Dennehy. He could have been could've... Brian Dennehy. Thank you. But he could not have easy. No way. First one needs to go on one of the, one of the two podcasts. I, oh, I totally agree. I think you should make Justina watch that one. We, we, Justina, because I'm thinking about <laughs> Justina. Right. So uh, he was considered for the role of Dan Gallagher in Fatal Attraction, which went to Michael Douglas. Unbel- <laughs> Who would want to ever bang Nick Nolte? <laughs> Here's a new game for you. He's been- <laughs> I didn't write this Welcome in the Welcome to notes. the game show. Bang Nick Nolte. <laughs> I didn't write this in the notes, but he was he's been married four times. He's got three kids. Oh boy. And last but not least, in our, our in our trip through the Nultiverse, he was considered for the role of Detective John McClain in Die <laughs> nope, Hard. I'm out. I'm done. Not happening. <laughs> what kind of universe is so in some universe that has happened? Right, right, right. Th- and th- they that are exists. miserable. And or or it's the greatest play. We we'll never know. <laughs> I know. That's trap. Ah. It's almost like he's an anti Forrest Gump, just kind of just <laughs> almost getting cast and everything on these famous yeah. movies. And in really epic spots. Oh, yeah. All of them. Oh, all of them. So, which, you know, look, he may have not been the right person for those particular roles, but it does say he's a caliber actor that the people are actually looking at him to. to oh, you know, he's massive. Oh, he's massive. Yeah, yeah, he's so, massive. I mean, so, you know, we joking aside, I mean, he's fantastic, but it's like. I could never picture him in any of these roles because we never had that, you know. That's right. That and so, but but you're right. There's some multiverse. Oh, he's the king of subtext stuff, though. Like that guy's the depth of his characters are always solid, and including in Mando. Like, uh, what's his name again? I always Khalil. Khalil is fantastic, and there's a depth to him, and uh, there's a history. He conveys history. Some of it's through the dialogue, but through the tone of his voice, the way he says things. Right. For a character that's kind of dry, he still puts history on the page, or in the screen. So that was uh, our, That's little, brave. our little <laughs> hockey, a uh, little uh, bounty puck on uh, Nick Nolte. Uh, just figure out next week what we're going to do. Yeah, every every week will be a different one. Ready for our summary? Let's do it. The Mandalorian is walking with a child who is in its floating cradle. Several lizard cur- creatures scurry past the rocks uh, uh, on uh, on the ground. The Mandalorian is suspicious. Puts his hands on his blaster when he's attacked by Trandoshans with vibro axes. They have an awesome fight, which leaves the Mandalorian victorious. He sees a tracking fob on the ground. More hunters are looking for the child. 
So Vice said, "We got we got first the the first shots of you know you know of this desert planet and tattooing four. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or well, as we discussed last week, California. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, more California. More California." And uh, so this is the first time we've seen live action Trandoshans actually do anything. Uh, uh, the last tra- live action Trandoshan we had was Bosk, right? Who just growled when Captain um, it wasn't Nita, it was a uh, Piet Admiral Piet was like bounty hunters. We don't need their scum, and there's like right. whatever he says. And so and and he and first the, appearance of Viber axes, I believe. First appearance of any Viber weapon. Yeah, I mean we you know we in just, live action in live, in live action. action. No, well, no. They had Viber axes in Jedi. That's where they first appeared, but they didn't move. That's true. This You're time right. they're moving, right. and that's what's exciting about it. So right. well, you know that both that and the Viber knife that's later in the episode. Um, it's a fight. It's a. It's a. He's attacked by three of them, and he Mandalorian hands handles himself. In fact, he disintegrates one. And that's one of the reasons. Just reason number one why this is my favorite episode: the introduction of disintegration. That's true. Because we did not really know what that line meant. It was always just a cool line. Until you physically got to see it happen. Yeah, so the line we're talking about, for those who haven't seen Empire Strikes Back, spoiler alert, Darth Vader talks to Boba Fett when they're all in the same scene about the, the you know, bounty hunters. We don't need their scum. Um, he warns Boba Fett to, uh, he wa- wants uh, Han Solo and the uh, crew of the Falcon alive. No disintegrations. Right. And so. And it's a big deal, though. Yeah, right. And Fett says one of his, like, four lines he has, or five right. lines, and as you wish, is one of them. Right. All right, real quick. So... How do you feel about the line, the the voice change in uh, Empire? Oh, I don't remember. I don't know if are you talking about the new one on Disney Plus? No, 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 well, no, no, no. So uh, it's not. I don't, it's not new. It's been around for a while. So Fett's lines are all been replaced with uh, the actor who played Django Fett. Oh yeah, nah, I don't like it. I don't either. I don't either. I don't. I don't. I don't under- Jeremy Bullock all the way. Well, it wasn't Jerry Bullock. Oh. It's um that he was just the body. Yeah, he's just a body, and he's just okay. one of the bodies. So, so the big myth is that Jerry Bullock is Boba Fett, and there's like yeah. five guys. Yeah. In fact, the guy who played uh, Jack, uh, John Morton, he yep. played Dak. You know, I could take on the whole empire. Yeah. In the in the in the scene where they're torturing Han, and uh, he's he's no good to me, dead. That's that's John. That's John Morton. That makes sense. You so, can't see his face. Right. So they're like, who can fit this costume? But and then, and then we're not talking about the four or five stunt actors who did it in uh, Jedi too. Right. They all tour. Jeremy Bullock's retired from touring, but most of them have picking up the slack. But there's a lot of Fets. I was like, I thought there was two, and then suddenly their Fets are coming out of the. It's like aliens are coming out of the walls. And a joke. <laughs> it's a clan of Fets. Clan of Fets. That evening, the child watches the Mandalorian try to fix his armor and see her wound on his left arm. The child tries to touch it, but the Mandalorian just picks him up and places him back in his cradle and covers it up with a blanket. They rest for the night. Next morning, they return to the Razor's Crest where they find it being dismantled by a clan of Jawas. The Mandalorian shoots them with a blaster, causing them to scatter, then, and they fight back, but the Mandalorian uses his pulse rifle to start disintegrating a few of them, and they flee to their sand crawler. The Mandalorian takes chase the child in the floating cradle, chases after him, which was adorable. <laughs> oh, it's fantastic. <laughs> Again, another moment of, I love the fact that the baby's just kind of like, yeah, and it's just going. <laughs> right, and and no fear, just yeah. whatever. I'm, I'm curious, did who did did the Mandalorian send that thing after him? I, I don't, I don't. What do you mean? So the, it. it I know they're the, talking about how it's following him. Yeah, how's it? I think it's something to do with his wrist. Right, because like he's he slings it right. earlier with the trash can. We, sorry, slang in uh, RPG we used to play. We call tr- Trandoshan trash, trash cans. cans. Yeah, but he would sling it, and so like he slung it. So I think it's it's whatever it is. It's a beacon to him. Right, so, so it just goes. Falling. So I think it's just following. He's, the baby's just going so for he's a just ride. Stuck, yeah. Just, what up? Yeah. But he's so cute doing it. He is, uh, and and it's really cool to see Jawas. I'm just excited. All right, we have to talk about that in a little bit though. The Mandalorian does his best Indiana Jones of the Last Crusade in imitation as he tries to storm the sand crawler. Jawas throw things at him from the sand crawler, but the Mandalorian manages to crawl his way to the top with the aid of his grappling hook and wire. Unfortunately for him, when he gets to the top, he's blasted off by the Jawas and crashes into the ground unconscious. The child waits for him to wake up, and the two travel the night <laughs> to, so to great. Khalil's moisture farm. Khalil is surprised that the child is, is causing the fuss. Uh, the Mandalorian learns about parenting as the child eats a frog, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> which is a good thing. Put that in your mouth. Uh, Khalil uh, will help the Mando get the parts back uh, for his ship from the Jawas. He has spoken. The next day, they head to the Jawa camp. It doesn't go very well. The Jawas are wary of the Mandalorian and his weapons. 
We found out that Mandalorian doesn't speak Java very well. Insults are tossed. Flamethrowers may have been used. <laughs> <laughs> But in the end, it's agreed that the Mango, the Mando will get an egg for the Jawas, and they will trade back hit the parts for it. So the three ride with the Jawas in the sand crawler until they stop at a rock formation. The Mando and the child leave and head through what leads to a cave. Uh, the Mando leaves the child behind. The Mando checks out the cave, finding bones and other nasty things, and that's where he encounters a mud horn. The mud horn is this huge, hulking rhinoceros-looking creature with a uh, woolly fur. And this one is surly. It pretty much beats the snot of the Mandalorian who keeps trying using different weapons on it. His armor's damaged, his weapons are broken or empty, and he prepares one last shot to kill the beast. He pulls out his boot vibro knife and is going to take one last stand when the force gets in the way. The child helps the Mandalorian by using the force to lift the mud horn into the air. It gives the Mando the chance to kill it with it with his vibro knife. The use of power exhausts the child and the Mando retrieves the egg. Which is also you, also woolly, ew, <coughs> and returns it to the Jawas who eat it. Also, ew. <laughs> uh, the Mando gets his parts, and Khalil helps him repair his ship. The Mando offers Khalil a job, but he turns it down. He's at peace. His valley is all good. He's grateful, but he's he's happy where he's at. With his ship repaired, the Mandalorian leaves leap with a child who is finally beginning to stir. Looks like the little one was going to be okay. Credits. <laughs> it's a fan. It's a fantastic. The the couple of things that that stand out to me. Um. Uh, I'll save one of them because I'll throw it in the fandom free zone. But one of the pieces is is I, I just really enjoyed the pace of this episode. I know it's short. I get it, but the pacing to me was so tight that the energy just flowed and there was gag moments and there was beats and, and you know, sorry, writing term, but there was moments that I that were like, oh, that was great. Or the action was where it needed to be and everything kind of built upon itself very well. Right. The the downside being like, I wanted a little more, but it's like having a, like we talked about, it's, it's, uh, it's like having a good cheeseburger, right? So the more I watch of this show, I am okay now with the length. The length is perfect. I... When I saw the first one, I was like, really, this is all we're going to get? Because we're so used to the hour-long right. internet show, uh, web uh, streaming show. And now, um, I've got a... It's 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 tasty and perfect. It makes me want more, but yep. I'm okay. Like, I don't... Like, I couldn't add anything to this episode to make it better. There's nothing more, like, I really need to know. Yeah, I'm with you. So, I, I mean, it's it's a good length, yeah. It is. it is, And it's... It, look, I'd rather have... We talked about this briefly last week, but I'd rather have things tightly paced and flowing out. Plus, we got to see lots of disintegrations, and we got to see him reload a gun, which you don't see in Star Wars. Right, yeah, but that's a, that's a new thing. Well, they did a little in Rogue One, but uh, that, I think Rogue One's the first time... Right, but this is like cartridges. I mean, this is like, like, which adds much more to the cowboy mythos, right? Right, because that's his long range rifle, and really, it's like a sharps, which is an old buffalo rifle, and he's just blasting everybody. It's funny how he deals with the Jawas, though it's cruel at the same time, right? So, I'm I'm curious about the Jawas in this episode. We touch about the. uh, I was raised. Like you were, yes. Knowing that the Jawas came from Tatooine and was indigenous to Tatooine, that is correct. And so now, I think they're not. Well, funny. I don't know what's canon anymore. In in RPG, I guess the Fantasy Flight is canon, or no? no? It is not. No, no, no. It's not canon. I had no it, idea. It, it it uses canon things, but I think I don't think anything it creates is canon. It's not part of. It can't be right, right but I don't think it's creating anything outside of adventures. I don't think it's like adding to. Mythology. They just had. They had a. They had. I rem- I, maybe I'm mixing in D6, the older system. The older system has... There's a had system. Jawas, but it talked about you could play a Jawa and they had left the planet. Like, they would leave planets. All right, so so that's in the Fantasy Flight and the, the, the um, uh, Wizard of the Coast versions. The, the soccer, the it's soccer. in both versions? Yeah, they're both soccer. You, okay. can play, you can play Jawas in both of them. So, so the idea is you can leave. So I understand... I've, played a Jawa once, I've always fine. bought that in my head. Of like, I'm okay with that part. I don't get the sand crawler part because, it, to me, it's the exact same ship. Right. And at one point, I because they don't name the planets often on this show very well, or they named this one though, didn't they? they in did. dialogue, no. But I've got the name of it, and we'll talk about it in the trivia. No, yeah, there we go. But I was it's like, a, well, maybe they are on Tatooine. That's kind of strange, like because it it had similar characteristics. It's California. Can, it's California. Uh, so by way of Tunzia. So I'm, Tunzania. Tunzania. So Tunzania. At first, I was like. These are Jawas that left Tatooine, and that and that would be a great story to find out because, you know, sand crawlers in Legends were, were 
by a mining guild that were came to terraform, and, and the, and the jaw was just infested and stole. Well, well t- no, well they didn't. Well, they didn't steal them. They were um, the company came to terraform. And I don't think it was terraform, but mine. Tatooine, and they find that there's nothing there. It's just, it's, Tatooine's literally a, a worthless rock. Right. So there's no minerals or anything for the find. So they, they spent all this money, and they were like, we'll just leave it. Yeah. It's cheaper to leave it. You're like, right. Like a lot of things, especially like yep. when, when we go to third world countries or whatever, we, yeah. it's, it's a lot cheaper just to leave that stuff behind. And so the Jawas kind of like appropriated it. Right. And so it became part of their culture. So... I'm, I'm watching this and thinking, well, maybe the whole, you know, like a, a clan leader took his sand crawler and got it on, on like a big transport ship to go somewhere else. And then I missed this because I'm colorblind. The Jawas on Tatooine eyes are yellow. The ones in this episode are, are red. red. Yeah. So it could be a whole different, just a whole different yeah. genre of Jawa. Yeah. So no, that's right. So who knows? Yeah. It's, it's crazy. A I always thought, and, and these. These jaw again. It's the first real interaction we've ever had with Jawas, aside from throwaway side characters, right? right? So uh, you're actually seeing culture. You're seeing like they had a they had a they did a very good job of building a culture into them that wasn't just grab things and go. Because clearly they're obsessed with right. the giant Cadbury egg, right? I I was reminded about of of the like old cowboy movies when the cowboy has to go negotiate with the Native Americans, right? I mean, that's what that scene is. He's right. going to go speak to the tribal chief right. about how he can cross their lands or that's whatever. Right. That's that, and he's really bad at speaking their language. And so, right, <laughs> and they're all like, "White man doesn't sounds like a Wookiee." Yeah. And I'm like, and for a second, I was like, I'm almost uncomfortable, but I'm okay with it. I, yeah, I, sure, I get, <laughs> sure. Because I know, I know, I know. John Favreau's not saying that Indians are Jawas, right? So, <laughs> but I'm like, I could kind of be a Jawa. I mean, <laughs> Well, I think, but it, in fairness, I think it's the tribal part, right, 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 right. But then you get that same tribal part later on right. with the yeah. Mando, so, yeah, so it's at least it offsets. It, but yeah, right, right. I just thought it was kind of funny. I, like I said, I wasn't offended. I, I get thought, it. I, thought, I totally get but it. But when I first saw it, I was like, "Oh, they're doing that." Yeah. I mean, I. But again, it's a great <laughs> Western trope. Right. I kind of, right? I kind of wish it. You ever seen Maverick? Oh yeah. I kind of wish there's a Jawa out there, like that. You know, yeah. who's. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, "Yeah, we just we hang out in there. Oh, Mando, come on! Yeah. <laughs> and they're all friends. And they they run scams together. Yeah, it's I want, brilliant. I want that. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. Um, I also like the fact that in in that sequence, we did finally get to see uh, the interior of a sand crawler, and it and him being so tiny, <laughs> and them laughing at him. Right, right. It's just gold. I mean, that's gold moments, right? Those are. I don't think someone. I, I read someone say that that was fan service, and I'll argue that it's not fan service, and this is not part of the the, the fandom stuff. But it, it's not because it's a fun gag. Fan service to me is if if they would have tied in the some kind of direct to Tatooine moment, like or some kind of robot that, that they were shopping again or some garbage. Right. Like oh look, that. here's R five D four. Yeah, there you Which go. Thank comes you. In later, but <laughs> yeah. It's not fan service, it's world building. Uh, that's how I see it too. It's world building. And yeah. so and, and and then again it is fan service because realistically the You're whole fan sh- though. Right. But the whole show is fan service. Yes, this because it's made off of characters that had six lines. Right. So, Come on. So, get over yourself. Right. So yeah, it's fan service. So yeah. you know. But in the right way, I guess. <clears throat> right. If there's a right way, it's <laughs> Yeah, if there, if there is a right way. Good good point. I mean, if there is a right way. And and so I'm I'm happy with it. I like seeing the Mudhorn fight again. I'm I'm obsessed. I love westerns, so this is all western tropes. This right. is 100. percent It's a beautiful thing. the 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 only challenge I've had with this episode, if I were attacking it slightly, is the fact that it is it's almost video game ish, um, like a cutscene. <laughs> it is, but you know what's funny is I say that, but I was thinking about this the other day. I don't Press think it's that dodge. movies are becoming like video games. I think that video games have become more like movies. Right. And so the writing tropes are starting to blur. The lines are getting blurred, and so you do have a all movies had a hero go on a journey. Video games have a hero going, on a, you know. So, but it's fantastic. The fight's good. Seeing him get his butt kicked, like he he's and not going like, to beat this. Just thing. like running out of weapons. I mean, oh, I, yeah. I, I I I was watching it. And I was like, surely he has to win this because right. he's our hero. But does it? I mean, is, are, are, he wouldn't have. He would have. And so, and it's important later. But so, it, he right. would not have won that right without Baby Yoda. So how how do you feel about Baby Yoda and the Force? Uh, I'm 100 percent in, and I and I the, the reason why is because they chose Baby Yoda, and I think it's a felony moment, maybe. But whoever picked Baby Yoda to exist, that care, whatever that creature race is, 
they knew that w- the instant you saw Baby Yoda, you thought about the Force. Right. They right. made that association. So clearly, they want us thinking about the Force. It's part of it. You're already okay with it. Who? I was just talking to a buddy. Who doesn't? Who doesn't like Yoda? Like, is there people out there that actually don't like Yoda? I don't care for Yoda. I yeah, but you don't dislike. Like, you don't, don't hate on. Right, do you hate on Yoda? No, I don't hate on Yoda. But no. I, I, I would tell you, as I, I've gotten older, when I watch Empire or Jedi, I'm just like I just. I usually now skip through Dagobah. Yeah, because I just don't care. <laughs> no, I get it, but like he, there's I, nothing. I, I, I prefer Yoda. Like in the prequels, he's at least interesting. Yeah, I, I like when you first see Yoda in Empire. I think it's oh, you know. Yeah. No, but the first time I saw so him, it was food of this type. Yeah, but he was magical the first time. I kind of I, I remember oh, yeah. seeing oh, him. Too, then, yeah, you know, and then and I was a little sad when he died in Jedi. I remember those moments, right? The um, the puppeteering of in of Yoda in Empire. Is still amazing. Oh, it's brilliant, and and still holds up. And it gave us the seagull song. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and now that goes into the show notes if you don't. Know. So you can check the show notes to find out what the seagull. Be cursed song. forever in your brain. And then uh, I'm also going to post. Have you heard the the, the, the Hamilton cover of uh, Dear Baby Yoda? No. I'll I'll fair, I'll share it, with, but I'll put it in the show notes on that one. Not brilliant. Uh, but um, the, it's it's funny to me how they got the puppeteering so good. In Empire, right? But in Episode One, when he when he was a puppet, he's no longer a puppet. I think he's they a were, terrible puppet. And, and Frank Oz still did it, and it's just a terrible. It doesn't look. Right. I mean, I it's know framing though. I mean, I, a lot of that has to do with that and, stuff. And I know he's supposed to look younger, but it was like. But Dagobah, if I'm not mistaken, I, I watched Empire Dreams not long ago. Dagobah was built yeah, up, yeah, right, yeah. And I don't think they did that with a lot of and Phantom then, Menace. And then in, I mean um, Phantom Menace. And then, um, when um, the Last Jedi shows up and it's a puppet again, it's just like. It doesn't look good. Yeah. It, it, it just didn't look... I mean, they built a new puppet, but to me, they just found the old one and it had decayed and put him up there. It was like, here's the corpse of Yoda. Let's have him... Oh. I think a lot of it had to do with Kirshner. I give Ir- Irvin Kirshner, director of Empire, a lot of credit for how he handled dealing, making a puppet. Frank Laws, too. Don't get right, me wrong. Right. But I think how it was lensed and staged and blocked, uh, I think a lot of that goes to Kirshner. Let's <laughs> dive into the, nulti- uh, the multiverse real quick. Originally, it was supposed to be um, Hanson doing Yoda. I didn't know that. Yeah, that's in the also in it. they talk about it in the Empire Dreams, but that's where I first heard about it. Maybe, maybe so. So Henson was supposed to do, it, but Henson couldn't do it. He was busy doing. Um, I think he was getting busy either doing the Muppet, Muppet movie or preparing to do the Muppet movie. Or Muppet, wow, and so they couldn't. Wow. So he's the one who suggested Frank Oz. So that's how Frank Oz got the gig anyway. Unreal. So imagine Henson as Yoda. Oh yeah, it would have been phenomenal. I, I Oz or is, or Kermity, either way. Oz Oz is the right choice. Don't yeah. get me wrong. But I think Yoda's a little more playful and a little bit more mischievous because when Kermit first arrived, when we first got we we were before, you know, before we were born when Kermit was around, he was like a he was like a creature of mayhem, yeah. and, and so he's this mischief maker and stuff. And so, uh, and if you watch Henson's work, there's a string of that in, in his works. So. I think Yoda would have been a little bit more, a little edgier, <laughs> a little edgier. So yeah. it would have been, would have it's been probably fun. better. But interesting. But I, I like the fact that we see the Force with Baby Yoda. I think it's important. I think it sets up stuff, and it didn't come out of the blue. I didn't. I wasn't like, oh my god, he used the Force. I was like, ah, okay, I get it. It works. So and it lets the story keep going. So I so I haven't seen the Phantom Menace either. Talk about um, Baby Yoda using the Force, just using the Force. Yeah, and so. And so, I, I think that's a good thing and a bad thing. And the bad thing is this: is that that they'll they, they won't complain about it from a baby Yoda, but they'll complain about it from a Ray in Force Awakens. Yeah, that gets into that gray area of uh, I have no ali- uh, allegiance to that. Uh, I'm I'm a I'm a political when it comes to the fandom menace opinion. Um, or no, I, no, I'm not. I, it's toxic. There, I think. I think that 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 the Phantom Menace is specifically. I, I toxic. think initially, maybe some of the some of the intentions weren't. But I, it's the internet, so I don't trust anybody anymore. Right, right. I got you. And so, I guess my point is, I'm not defending any of it. They're they're a holes, and I'm not a big right, fan. I'm not defending either. I'm but just, it, it's more a matter of like, you're right. Why did they not attack the? Ba- Here's the fascinating thing about the Mandalorian right now. Like, even let's just speak in two episodes. Right. I, there was very little back chatter. Even in two right, episodes, right. it was quiet. It, the, and it, maybe it's because Nine is on its way out, and we've got plenty of ammunition. There's right. spoilers dropping every week, and plenty of stuff for them to destroy. So, Th- Episode three, there's a little bit, and it was, it was, I think it was forced. And we'll talk about an episode when we do yeah. next week's episode a little bit about it. And then um, 
Four has a lot of backlash. <laughs> yeah, four, but I think, not, it, but not, but no, from the Phantom Menace, not from, not from. Oh, like, interesting. Yeah, so we'll talk about that for yeah. you. But so it, it, you know, early on, it, it, yeah. it doesn't come. But my point is, is that yes, Yoda is maybe Yoda is fifty, but he's clearly an a, a infant toddler. I mean, he's two, right, or less than two, so eighteen. He's months. somewhere in there, yeah, yeah for I mean, sure. Yeah, he's he's a for all intents and purposes a baby. Yep. So. You're not training that to do. <laughs> no, and but that's also what I like because it, it's it's pure force will, right? right? So which, which again, I say this. I think I say this about every six months in a different podcast, especially when it comes up to Ray. Yeah, and about how Ray's this Mary Sue and Ray did you know how Ray did all this stuff without she was training. Uh, I'm going to play the clip of from from um, of what Obi Wan says to Luke about the force. I'll play it now. And then we'll talk about it. So what he says is that the force um, flows through you. And Luke asks, well, does it, uh, it command your actions? And he says, yes, but it also obeys your commands. Right. So it does both. Right. And so the force, like, if you need to use the force, it'll help you. My, my, so I'm with you. And this is where I, this is where my deviation from those knuckle turds exists pretty, pretty, the Phantom Menace knuckle turds exist pretty heavily. And it comes down to this. My, my issue with it, and I did not feel like it happened here. And this is why I think they chose Yoda, is, or chose a baby Yoda, is that in in the the Ray scenarios, it's gotten to a point where she suddenly has a force power that's convenient for the story. That I'm having a tough time, and I understand that it's the force willing it. I I get it, but it it's we've not seen a lot of that before. So so can, can I counter? Yeah, please. Um. Do you think it's more that we uh, know that Yoda is a force-using being, and we've never seen him train? Right. And the only person we have to compare Ray to is Luke, and we've watched Luke train. But saying that, well, we have—I I think you have Anakin, though. I think you can look at Anakin as another I, example of that. We we can, but I th- I, th- I think let's out of the movies and not pulling in cartoon right, at right, all, right, right. just staying strictly I, I, film. I, I'm, I'm saying strictly film, and I'm, and I'm you know I'm going to take the prequels out of this. Um, but, um, so yeah, Ray does all this other, this, this stuff, but Luke also blew up the Death Star with the force. (laughs) No, no, I get it. It, to me, it's more a matter of, it's the matter of the amount of times that it occurs. And, and and again, just going into the story, story, it doesn't matter if it's Ray, I don't care who's doing it. Right, right, right. It didn't matter. Princess Leia, or I'm sorry, General Leia flying out of the thing and suddenly having force powers when... Again, not ever nothing set up that except right. for lineage. I have an issue with. So the only thing I have an issue with that I don't. I, I'll buy it. I'll buy it. She's a Skywalker. I'll buy it because that's what we've been told, right? So that gives me. Yeah. The, I only the, my, what took me out of that was the bad. Uh, oh, Adobe, it was terrible. The Adobe After Effects of her flying into it just didn't. It, if you're gonna do it, make it cool. It was, I'm Mary Poppins, y'all. It, it, was, was, it, it was, but it looked like really bad After Effects. And so bad. if you're gonna do it, you're gonna you know you know. Anyway, we're we're getting too too far off on that. But I just I was curious about your thoughts about the Force. I buy it. I think I love I love that. Again, my thing is if it wasn't Baby Yoda, right. I'd have a bigger question for it. And so I think because we accept it, we're we, and we're already putting it in our head canon that the obviously his race has some uh, uh, affinity with the Force that's stronger. Hundred percent. So that's if that's, it had been a human, I think it'd been an issue. I think we're dancing around it, so let's go ahead and get into yeah. <laughs> your segment, sir. All right. So actually, this one is a is the Phantom Free Zone, and it's a special edition because I really don't have anything much I can attack. We teased on some pieces there. Right. And the reason why I can't attack much is because I want to separate something very important from the scenario. I want to talk about the fact that this episode has very few words. It is... I, I guarantee you, word count wise, it has the least amount of words that, of an episode we've seen thus far. I don't know if that's a fun fact you have. I do. Up. I do. I'll tell you the trivia of that too. So, uh, I'll let you guess. How in percentage? How much of this episode is told without any dialogue? Uh, sixty-five percent. Sixty percent. Yeah, that's a huge number. When was the first? Do you remember? Do you? At what time point do you think uh, the first line was spoken? It's when he meets uh, Khalil. Yeah, but wh- how far? Oh, how, so that's so probably, I don't know, out of a 32-minute episode, if that's right, it's probably, geez, it's probably 16 minutes in. 11 minutes, 32 11 seconds. minutes in. 11 minutes, and this is my fandom yeah. fact. This is why I'm fandom free zone. Regardless of whether you like The Mandalorian and you're a Star Wars fan, I'm saying separate yourself from that for a moment. This is a phenomenal feat. Oh, yeah. 
this is breaking the rules of storytelling. This is going. This is giving. This is handing a fantastic world to Rick and or whatever, however you say it. I'm not even gonna try his last name. I'll mess it up. But you hand him this world, the director, and you turn around and say, create. And they take this script and they take this idea and they go this far with it where you don't say a single word. No, there's not even uns and uns. There's no subtle. It's straightforward. So you, you say it breaks. It's all character. You say it breaks the rules. But you know what's funny? Because you know, I also went to film school. Yep. And... The biggest rule they were always teaching us was show not tell. That's this exactly what right. this does. This it's exactly what it does. It just shows. But in this day and age, it's very hard. Why? Right, right, because right. dialogue's cheap. Right. That's the thing that people don't understand. Action on a page. So you could have, if you break down a script, every screenplay is broken into to eights. Eight eighths of a page is right. one page, right? right? Right. And each one's a beat. An action beat could be like, uh, the Mandalorian chases, is a sim- one eighth of a page sentence. The Mandalorian chases after the sand crawler shooting. Um, uh, Jaw was in his way. Right. That's one eighth of a page. You got to fill that. I do dialogue. I can fill up a page of dialogue in nothing because a block of dialogue fits in the center of the page. And I know that sounds crazy, but that's how you break down a script. That's dollars and cents. That's true. So at the end of the day, dialogue is cheap. You know why Quentin Tarantino, brilliant as he is on the writing side, his movies, not that they're cheap, but his movies are a huge bulk of dialogue, massive amounts of dialogue, right? Right. Right. Well, that's cheaper than having these extravagant explosion. It's not Michael Bay where you got to blow everything up. Right. That's why Michael Bay's films have very few words. So it's a massive feat for him to turn around and, and in this episodic type content, especially a second episode. Right. That's it's- where the risk really is for me. So the Phantom Free element is that take yourself outside of the Star Wars and appreciate this little section because this is one of the ones that's magical as art. They literally high-level craftsmanship, arguably art, they made something very, very different that you don't see a lot on television anymore. You could have said it any better. That's there you go. F- fantastic. I, I 100% agree with you. I'm glad you had a fact on that, though. That's I, good. I did. That makes my fandom-free moment feel better. So uh, since we're talking about facts, let's get into the trivia. I mentioned the uh, eyes uh, of the Jawas, so we've talked about that. But here's, here's something that's crazy. Ready? So the dialogue isn't impressive, right? You know what else is impressive? A human face is never shown in this episode. Oh, that's right. That's brilliant. No human beings. None. No, no, we don't see a face. Not a single face. That's brilliant. So another mm-hmm. note into the mix. Uh, the child, or aka Baby Yoda, is a practical effect and not CGI. He's CGI enhanced, but he's a practical effect. So carry on with the original saga of Star Wars. It uh, uses animatronics to get more of the authentic performance, which is great. So which is which is good. I'll also mention the Star Wars book and comics. Uh, this is the first live action appearance of a working vibro knife. Vibro knives and vibro blades have in, um, internal generators that make them vibrate to cause more damage. If you blink, you'll miss it. But what, next time you watch the episode, watch the blades. They move. Yep. Um, they wobble. They do wobble. <laughs> and they hum, too. Yep. During the rebuilding sequence, a brief scene shows the screen of the name of the planet in Arabish. Which no trans- joke. Uh, which translates to Arvala 7. Do we have any idea where that is? Is no, there any star map for that at not, all? Not yet. Because this is all rim. It's yeah, all, all out, of rim. Out, of, out of rim. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. I'm glad somebody decoded that. Yeah, there's those people out there. That's why they put all the Arabic stuff in there. So, and I guess now with the Galaxy's Edge, you got the app. You can type it in. You can type. Yeah, that's order, a good point. So, so there's no canonical source for uh, has revealed for what a Jawa looks like under their hood. And the behind the scenes shots from Return of the Jedi, the Jawas have squares heads covered. And black cloth with yellow eyes, and which appear to be mechanical. However, uh, this is a caution that uh, may not represent their true selves. The original Star Wars novelization implies a possible familiar relationship between Jawas and Tusken Raiders. It also describes Jawas as a rodent-like and, and compares them to devolved humans. Though these could be metaphors. According to Stephen uh, Sansweet's book, Star Wars from Concept to Screen, uh, the Jawas are the centerpiece in one of the strangest copyright infringement cases involving Star Wars. What? In 1978, small hooded creatures with glowing eyes that Neil Young called Road Eyes began accompanying the rocker on stage during his concert tour. You are kidding me. Uh, in a tour film and on the cover of the album, Russ Never Sleeps, the case was settled out of court. You are kidding me. I, I need to go find some footage of that. I'll, I need to see Jawas in a rock band. If I can if I can find it, I will post it on the show. Holy now. smokes, that just blew my mind. <laughs> Scotty's fun facts, brain blown. I just got disintegrated. That's what I should have said. <laughs> You've been disintegrated. You've been disintegrated. Um, I love the episode. Yeah. I love what I'm watching so far. I love the the world building. 
Um, I, you know, it's it's going to be interesting to see where this goes. I mean, you know, we're fu- we're a few more episodes in, so we kind of know, but the deep dive is going to be really really fun. Well, the further you go in, I think there's going to be a lot of callback scenarios, right? I think I think pieces. I think everything feels purposeful so far, and that's the beauty of this episodically. I don't feel like we've hit a lot of fluff. Um, there's some, but I don't think we've hit a lot of fluff. But we won't know that, of course, until you analyze the entire th- season and you look at it as a whole. But right now... Right, well, that's seven episodes away for, from our show. Yeah, from this show. <laughs> so two episodes seven in, weeks. everything has happened for a reason. And like we argued last week uh, in the Fan and Free Zone, even the front half, that first that, that section, um, even though a lot of people dissed on it, it's still relevant, like right. the, the Horatio Sands section. So everything has set up something. It's good stuff. All right. Well, if you've got questions or you've got comments for yourself, or tell us your thoughts. We might read them on the air or try to a- answer them. You can check us out on the Facebook page at my Star Wars uh, facebook.com slash my Star Wars Life. Uh, the link is will be in the show notes and also on the, I guess the show notes on both the website and on the um, your uh, probably your favorite podcast ad- app. Just click it, and if you're not a member of Facebook, join just for that. That'd be great. Yeah, that'd be delightful. <laughs> and so we'll, we'd love to talk to you. Also, post really fun stuff there, so you'll. And we'll play games and stuff. It's really cool. Uh, I think I'm good. So next episode will be episode three, uh, The Sin. Yep. We get to figure out what The Sin is. Ooh. I'm all excited. I know. <laughs> this yeah, is- we got it. <laughs> it's got some great moments in it that I can't wait to discuss. I can't wait to do the research on it. I'm looking forward to it. This is Scotty saying this is our contribution to the multiverse. Go out and make yours. Kohas out. Utini. We have spoken. Thank you for listening to the Mobcast Network.